Hi, welcome to the Leadership Enigma. I'm Adam Pacifico. I hope that you are listening to this on any one of your favorite podcast platforms, but I also hope you'll take advantage of the fact the YouTube channel is now live. And we are going through the incredible back catalog to put 50 to 60 hours of amazing interview footage onto the channel and every single episode now that we record will also go on to the YouTube channel. So this is no exception. You do not want to miss this episode. I've got the wonderful Adrian Simpson, who's the co-founder of Wavelength. Now, one of the terms that I hear all the time, and we're going to discuss this, Adrian, is the term outside in. What on earth does that mean? Why is that even important to leaders? And if you are a leader of any size business, how do you actually become more outside in? This is important. A recent CEO study in relation to what are the key capabilities or traits that are required by CEOs now, today in 2023, with the world that is bonkers, is that of foresight. So this perhaps has never been so important as it is right now. Outside in, come back to me just after this break. You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International, a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. So it's a big warm welcome to Adrian. Adrian Simpson, welcome to the Leadership Enigma. It's a pleasure to be here, Adam. Thank you for inviting me. Now, I have I say this all the time, but I have. I'm really looking forward to this one because the term outside in comes up all the time in leadership conversations. And I'm not so sure that everyone really understands what that means. But before we get to that, because that's going to be the essence of our conversation, is you're the, one of the co-founders of Wavelength. Yep. But just help the listeners and watchers, I get excited now when I say that, just help everyone understand a little bit about your CV, your background, and why you're so passionate as well about leadership development. Well, gosh, uh, so I started this world, uh, oh, gosh, back in about 1875 with a... Uh, <laughs> You're with looking a, <laughs> good, guys, to say for it. With the, uh, the Tom Peters, actually, uh, uh, for, who was one of the world's most admired management gurus back in the 80s. Yep. And, and uh, I had the pleasure of working with Tom for a couple of years. And then um, I actually uh, then joined a very small innovation business uh, back in the, in the early 90s called What If? And I was there for 11 years. Uh, it went from 10 people to 350 people when we were there. One of the things that I instigated when I was there was global tours. So I created a brand within What If to take leaders to places like Silicon Valley, yep. which is kind of which I've, I've, I've evolved in my new business, um, and to learn uh, from the outside. And then, yeah, uh, 15 years ago, I co-founded um, Wavelength. And so I'm, I build myself as co-founder and chief connector, because uh, which is what I basically spend my time doing I quite of, like of, of Wavelength. And we are a, yeah, we're a we're a very um, boutique um, specialist player in the kind of executive education leadership development space and our entire rationale and existence of business is to help bring the outside world in for leaders and you spoke about and it's very powerful but I also understand how how much effort goes into taking leaders to go and see another sector go see another yeah. another leadership team on in some ways to take them out of their comfort zone mm. you know take the pharmaceutical executive to Silicon Valley or to to wherever it might be yeah uh, and that's why I was keen that we chatted because I suppose there are two ways of looking at things. There's the inside out yeah. where we're very good at what we do yeah. uh, in the moment, in the department, in our specialist area, and we then create products or services for the outside world. But it's this outside in that I really want to focus on because it's just so important. Let me start with, with the basics. What do we mean by outside in as regards leadership? I think it's the discipline of learning from um, uh, people, industries and sectors um, very different from your own. From your own. Mm -hmm. I think in this day and age, um, if you are operating in the echo chamber of Zoom, Zoom or Teams, yeah. um, it's just it's dangerous in this world, which is so fast paced, so uh, so so volatile. And so I think it's learning the value of actually, I would articulate it as pressing the pause button, stopping what you're doing, and spending time looking outside for 
ideation, pattern identification, provocation, inspiration. I mean, I find it very interesting. Um, you know, so we talk about wavelength with providing our clients with world class inspiration, education, and provocation. Right. To the inspiration point, it fascinates me. In every other sector of life, yep. you will hear people say, "I was inspired by." Every great music artist, every author, every every actor or actress will talk yeah. about my inspiration came from. Yes. We don't talk about that in the business world. Or le certainly less so. Or, or less so. Yeah. Less so. Does it mean it's less valid? I don't think it is actually, but it doesn't seem to be as recognised as as a as a as 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 a form. And so, but I've seen for myself through you know taking thousands of leaders now, both physically and digitally, inside the boardrooms of shop floors, some of the world's most admired, successful businesses in China, yep. America, Europe, uh, India, wherever. The power of it, uh, and so it's learning from others, you know, not like you, because I think so many people are just. Great, you've got 25 years experience working for in, in the finance industry or maybe a particular bank or a particular oil company or a particular car company. That gives you great depth and great strength. It doesn't give you breadth. Right. And I think, you know, developing breadth is such an important component for leadership these days. I mean, we just can't operate in a vacuum. No. I mean, we probably have never been able to, no. but certainly in a world that won't stop still. Absolutely. And so many people are asking the question of what do the future leaders need to have? Yeah. And I spoke about some research that spoke about foresight, yeah. really top of the list for CEOs. And, and I hope this is relevant to any leader of any size yeah. business. And I just want to start with, with one thing, because I think we spoke about this a number of weeks ago. We, we talked about human-centered organizations. Yeah. Now, a passion for me is human-centered leadership. Yeah. But let's be honest, we're dealing with humans within an organization. Yeah. What's your take on a human-centered organization? Well, I mean, for me, uh, I mean, I spend my life trying to look for what I would call, you know, great places to work. Yep. And you simply can't have a great place to work unless you have basically, you know, a great place to work culture, which is basically a human people centered culture. And so you take, you know, iconic business like, you know, Southwest Airlines, unequivocally one of the world's most admired organizations, right? You know, their entire, it is the most profitable, most admired, most successful airline in the world, bar none, subject to Harvard, Wharton, INSEAD case studies, now the largest player in America, you know, and they will talk about, you know, you begin with a relentless, compulsive, obsessive focus on your people. That's stage one of your business model, right? You really double down on who you're recruiting, how you're recruiting them, how you engage them, how you communicate with them, to ensure you've got fully motivated employees. If you've got really engaged, motivated employees, there is a chance that they will deliver what Southwest strive for, which is positively outrageous service. Or indeed, now they're even striving for hospitality. Right? There's an extraordinary example of this, isn't it? I, did, I think you shared with me how they recruit. Yeah, that, oh, absolutely. Tell yeah. that story. Well, just uh, and I, just before I do that, yeah. so, so you, you, they say, you know, amazing people will hopefully deliver amazing service. You've got amazing people delivering amazing service. Yeah. There's a chance they will deliver great profits, right? So it's people, service, profit in that order, right? right? And so to your human-centered approach, you know, you can't sheep dip people in service training if you've got a dysfunctional culture. It right. will shine through. People, service, profit. But to give you an example, so yep. there, you know, so this is this is the same with Southwest Airlines, same with Ritz-Carlton, same with Four Seasons, same with Airbnb. You know, their, their belief is you have to be uncompromising on culture fit, right? And therefore, in your recruitment process, you are first and foremost recruiting for attitude over skill, right? Okay. What's the character of the individual, right? And so, so you ask yourself, well, how do you, how do you recruit for character? So at Southwest Airlines, I was speaking to Elizabeth Bryant, who's the vice president of people there last year. And she said, well, let me give you an example, agent. She said, if we fly you in for interview at Dallas Love Field, which is where their base is, she said, um, <clears throat> by the time you get to my office, if you get to my office, I love that. We if. will have checked back with everybody you've interacted with on the value chain getting to my office. So we'll check with the shuttle, with the crew on the plane which flew you over. We will check with the receptionist of the hotel we put you in. In we will check in with the shuttle bus driver who drove you this morning. We'll check in with the doorman and we'll check in with the person on reception. Interesting, they refer to the, as the director of first impressions. Because that's exactly <laughs> I love that. Which the is director of first impressions. Which is exactly what they are. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's exactly what they are. And with that in mind, why so many businesses have outsourced their receptions to G4S, who also run prisons, is beyond me, right? <laughs> I don't know what you're striving that's, your first impression to be, but it's when not... when you say it like that, yeah, that's quite <laughs> right. interesting. But it's, you know, you think, and 
I would say walking inside an organization is like walking inside a hotel. You form an opinion of it in the first 35 to 40, 60 seconds, right? Yeah, first impression. Yeah, count. exactly. Anyway, so back to the, the, the Southwest Airlines. So, so what we're trying to do is if at any point in that value chain you have been rude to anybody, we will terminate the interview at that point. Right. Because if you're the kind of person who's going to be rude to a flight attendant or a shuttle bus driver, you are the kind of person who's going to be rude to a waiter and charming to the interviewer, right? Right. We're not looking for that. We're looking for the kind of person. So so brilliantly, and she, she also gave me another, another great example, which I thought was a fantastic interview question. She said, so I'm trying to figure out, are you, because they're in the service business, right? And like Airbnb, you want people to be other-centric. She says, I'm trying to figure out, are you the kind of person that's all about you or about your team and, and others? So she said, one of my favorite interview questions is, tell me about your team professionally and personally. And if somebody can't tell me any of the characteristics of a team that they say they lead, the names of their people's spouses, the name of their children, where do they go on a holiday, what's their dog, what their favorite thing about it tells me everything I need to know about you as a leader. It's all about you and not question. about them. It reminds me of, and I've said this before on episodes, you know, my mentor has said to me, the children of the people you lead know your name. Yes. In what context is entirely up to you. This is personal. Mm. And there's that human-centered connection again. And we, we, we run some simple exercise, which is I'm sure you do as well, where people just really talk about them as in who am I yeah. and go to a slightly deeper level. And, and it takes minutes. Yeah. And some people say, I know more about this person than I do about people on my team who I've led for three years. Yeah. And that's the craziness of yeah. it. We're at this very superficial level. Now, I don't know what, what that's about, whether that's personality driven, it's fear driven, there's a vulnerability, a humility, all of these. Mm. But am I right in saying that really... One of the things that any future ready leader needs to have is an ability to connect deeply at a human level. Oh, 100%. And I would say, you know, increasingly, and um, uh, uh, we had the pleasure of hosting um, Tim Munden, who's the former chief learning officer of Unilever recently, and a chap called Steve Cadigan, who's, who's a, one of the world's leading thought leaders in the future of work. And, uh, but Tim touched upon on, on, on vulnerability. Mm. And I would say, you know, Leaders in the past were expected to have all the answers, right? We led in hierarchical organization. Command and control. Command and command and control and the higher up, you know, the smarter you were and all the answers. That just cannot fly and does not fly in this day anywhere, right? It's just hmm. impossible. And I think, you know, related point is, 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 that, is that, 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 I'll come back to the vulnerability point, but it's never been a more complex time to be a leader. Right. We touched upon this in our conversation the other week, which was if you look at all the agendas as a leader now, you're supposed to have a have a view on right yes. mental health, diversity and inclusion, sustainability, global su supply chain crisis, um, geopolitics. I mean, I was on a phone with a call with a client in America and said, we are having to take a stance on our policy regarding whether our employees can travel state to have an abortion. Right, right. Post you, can't, you can't duck it, right? Yeah. I mean, that would never have been on the agenda, right? Mental health, you're supposed to be resilient, you're supposed to be resourceful, right? You, you just said so all those, it's impossible, impossible. These are life and global issues, totally. not work-based exactly. issues. Exactly, exactly. So you can't, as a leader now, possibly be on top of all those things, right? So I think appropriate vulnerability to say, I'm really struggling with this, or I don't know the answer to this, you know, as Tim said to, to, to me, you know, promote psychological safety, yeah. right? If you've got a leader who says, I don't know the answer, but help, you know, or I'm really struggling with this right now, you know, yes. can you help me out? Can you step in? Do you have a point of view, right? That creates psychological safety in your team. And what does psychological safety do? We know through it research, increases motivation, increases satisfaction, increases yeah. innovation. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a great benefit to being appropriately vulnerable, as a leader, you know, and not shying away from the fact that sometimes we just don't know what to do, you know, but it goes back, therefore, to also being vulnerable, but also saying, okay, I am actually going to stop and I'm going to connect with others that might have, I'm a great believer in a concept of swipe with glee, right? Say again. Swipe with glee. Right, right? swipe, be, with, swipe glee. with glee. Because, you know, somebody pointed out to me years ago, it doesn't matter what industry or sector you're in, whether you are an airline, a hotel company, a retailer, an automotive manufacturer, a, a bank. Yep. We all are trying to grapple with the same core issue. How do you engage and motivate the human spirit? Right? None of us yet employs robots. <laughs> right? Yet. Right? Yet. Right? Yet. 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 Right? Right? So 
the core challenge remains the same, right? Mm. Doesn't matter what sector. There may be some nuances, but fundamentally, so just on that topic, learning about how others go about engaging the hearts and minds yes. of tens of thousands of people, you may just learn something, right? Or how are others grappling with, you know, the future of work right now or hybrid or remote working? Because everyone is trying to figure their way through this incredibly relevant challenge right now. So I knew we were going to land on, on the human piece very quickly in this conversation, Adrian, because when we talk about outside in, it's actually now talking about the life that we're all having to lead yeah. outside of the business and what does that mean for people at yeah. a deeply personal level. Yeah. And so I'm going to moving, I'm moving through the kind of the what, why and the how. So just summarize for me. So leaders should think about the outside in as what? If you could always give that a headline point, what would you kind of give it? I give it as a as a as an invaluable source of inspiration, ideage, ideation, and also actually energy. Right. And it and, it, and energy is a really interesting thing. And in fact, a guy called Jeff McDonald, we we work with, um, former Unilever board director, would actually actually say he asks a very provocative question, which is, what is the single most valuable resource your organisation has? And his answer to that question is energy. Right. And I think it's, he's absolutely on the money. Most leaders will say it's our intellectual property, it's our people, it's some cliched answer. And actually, it's energy, right? And so, and I, and, and he's right, because if you have energy personally and energy, you know, as a team organization, you can shoot for the moon. If you don't, yeah. you can't, right? Well, how do you get energy, right? And so I think sometimes the, just the discipline of stopping, listening, pausing, getting ideas, getting inspiration is incredibly important because it gives you that, oh, shit. I'm not not just me. Yep. Sometimes it's verification that I'm not just struggling at this. It's others are struggling with it, or someone just gives you a like. Oh, it was called what's called a golden nugget. Oh my God! I could swipe with glee that idea. Might have to adopt the principle of it for the execution of my Borrow organization. With pride. Borrow with swipe with glee. Yeah. Borrow it with pride. Okay, exactly. no, I love that. Um, I want to talk to you about the why. Then why is this so important? Yeah. If, if we now understand the what, and I know we were just chatting, having a coffee earlier, talking about you mentioned Rosalind Torres. Yeah. So take us a little bit through why is this important? Because yeah. I think leaders understand it is, but yeah. now let's really give that some yeah. some, some credibility yeah. to, to the answer. Why? Well, well, I think I'll just briefly reference the point earlier. It's never been more complex. Right? You're never having to grab so many agendas. Yeah. So there's no way you can be on top of everything. You can't the be the master of You, you all. can't, right? No. Sec secondly, Rosalind Torres um, uh, uh, d did some research around this. So Rosalind Torres, managing director of the Boston Consulting Group, did a TED Talk a few years back, got about 2 million views on the results of a global survey they'd done at BCG on what are the traits that leaders will need in the future, right? And then the answer to the, to the survey, they actually asks three, two or three really provocative questions. Okay. One of which is, where are you looking for pattern identification, ideation, stimulus, right? Or like, what, what's next? What's next next? Where are you looking, right? And the answer is in your diary, right? Who are you spending time with on what? I love that answer. Right? And it's as simple as that. Because you look at your diary, and if every single day from 8 in the morning or 6 in the evening is barcoded with Teams calls or Zoom calls or internal meetings, and that's your world, that is not good enough in this Well, there's conference. your evidence for being inside out. Absolutely. Absolutely. To stop dancing around the handbags, look at your diary. Sorry. So, but she was like, she was saying, you know, our strong evidence is that ability to be looking outside for that pattern identification right. and verification is critically important. Okay. Second point was... What's the diversity measure of your personal and professional stakeholder network, right. right? And again, so many leaders, I find, are spectacularly insular in terms of their networks. They have incredible networks internally. Echo chambers. In echo chambers. It may be in their own, uh, their own division, their own, maybe across the organization, but usually in silos, right? Once you step outside of that, you really struggle. And at Wavelength, what we like to do is to, is to, is to reframe this whole thing about the power of, of, of external networks to be about the concept of your personal boardroom and not the concept of networking. And there's a very different thing. So the term networking, so as soon as you start talking to most leaders they start about to hyperventilate. They hyperventilate, oh my God, am I going to a cocktail party with a glass of wine? And yep. I think those networking events should be outlawed. Okay. I think they are a futile waste of time and money, right? I'm not talking about that. What the personal boardroom is about, and it's a brilliant concept by two, Dr. Zala King and, and Amanda Scott, um, again, who looked at, it, it, as a leader, you need to have a tight network of people yep. around you 
each of whom are playing different roles. And so their visual for this is you've got a boardroom, you turn to your left or right now, you've got a boardroom table in front of you, there's 12 seats, there should be somebody in each of those seats playing a different role, right? That and diversity of diversity, thought, And they've codified those roles. So yeah. give you a couple of examples, yeah, right? So one role is um, um, the nerve giver, right? Sounds funny, but it's like you've got a presentation to do to the executive board, right? You're absolutely panicking. You phone them up, it's not your mother, and they say, you're gorgeous, you've got this, right? Who's that person, right? You're, you know, who's your, who's your, who's your, who's your, um, your sponsor, right? Who's talking about you when you're not in the room? Who's championing your cause? Which is right? so important. Which is critically important, right? In your career development, in your personal development, right? Who's your coach? Who's your mentor? Who is your chief connector? So you've decided, you're listening to this podcast, go, oh my God, yes, I need to get out more, right? Yeah. You're right, I'm terribly insular. Anyway, so you've now decided you've got to just scratch that itch. Who's the person or people you're going to call upon who can help you break out of your current silo? Right. Who's the person you know has the best black book, but more than that is generous with it? And they say, Adam, I've got it. You want to meet Bob. I'll leave it with me. I'll come back to you in 24 hours. Yeah. And you know they'll I'll make it happen. I'll make it happen, right? Who's that individual? And how do you cultivate more of those? And so what's brilliant about the personal boardroom is you can literally download a tool. You can do a test on the power of your personal boardroom. But it gives you tangible language around the kind of people you should have in your career to help you develop, you know, personally and professionally. It's also, when I listen to that, it's also about being more deliberate. Totally. So actually critically thinking, yeah. who do I have or do I need yeah. in that role? Yeah. Because we all say we're a product of, of the circles within which we yeah. operate and which we live. So, and leadership is, is really requires energy. Yeah. And time yeah. to think and reflect yeah. about our own yeah. personal leadership. Yeah. So in many ways, this is hard work for people, yeah. but it's worth doing. It is. How is this? I've got another question. Did the pandemic push us more inside in your experience, or did it force us to look more outside? Because there was a yeah. an outside event going yeah. on. But did it? Yeah. I don't know. Did it? Did it push people more into the oh, uh, I've got uh, to make sure this works because oh, we're going out of business. Yeah, unequivocally, I would say. I mean, certainly for the first twelve months or so. I mean, it was survival. Right, it was survival. We were all I mean, in that. Weren't exactly. We? I mean, it was like you know, and so even the, you know, the the even if you were you know a leader with long tenure in yep. a, a organization, at least perhaps in the old world, you might get random stimulus from somebody you met on the train or the plane or you know or a or a you know I sort of after it's a hideous networking event, but at least you went somewhere, yeah. right? <laughs> right, that went, right, that went, and you are now suddenly at home, not going anywhere, you know, with a very very small no human group, proximity, no, no, no proximity at all, right, and and. Uh, and so I think it massively pushed us internally. Um, but I, I think it may now have reignited in people actually the need, though, to go, oh, my God, I cannot live my life this in such an insular way, right? Mm. And, and, and so I think, you know, there's now almost being a bit of a reaction to go, Christ, we can no longer uh, operate this way. We have to be much more aware externally of what is happening yeah i always love that question i saw once it was who who struggled the most the extrovert or the introvert discuss <laughs> yeah. you know, in, in the pandemic yeah. and i think the debate still rages yeah. as regards that so when we talked about you talked about rosalind torres and, mm -hmm. and that video and those i love those questions and those answers mm -hmm. there and I, I hope people listening and watching are thinking hang on i need to reflect on some of those um what have you done differently or wavelength done differently off the back of you thinking about this now or even working on this with with your clients is there something that stands out for you in relation to you know the why this is so important and it's so important for you to keep driving this conversation well actually i mean the the pandemic forced us actually to reevaluate and re reinvent our business model actually and thank god it did because you know previously and currently and we still do this you know we had a very high touch model right so we would take leaders physically to places like silicon valley or yep. india or china and we ran a UK program where, we, you know, in the UK program, we did these, you know, we call them behind the brand visits and you go and spend the day at Protein Manger or Lego or Liverpool Football Club, wherever you Brilliant. Fantastic. Amazing programs, but very quite selective. You know, 20 people in Silicon Valley, 20 in, in China, yeah. you know, 50 on Connect, wherever it was. But, you know, in, in, in market it, yeah, immersion. Exactly. But, you know, what's, what we created actually out of pan, the de pandemic actually was a structure which has enabled our clients for the first time ever to bring the outside world in for their leaders or whatever scale they want, 
right? So okay. every single month, you know, we run a live session, 90 minutes from a studio somewhere around the world or from inside a business somewhere around the world, where we take now 800 leaders from around the world. Virtually. Virtually yep. inside a great organization of an audience with a really accomplished leader. So we've hosted, you know, we've had sessions we've learned from Alan Job, Unilever's chief exec, uh, Jesper Brodin, Ikea's chief exec. I'm flying to Dallas next month to host two of the board of Southwest Airlines. We're going to Lego. We're going to Apple. We're, you know, and, and so... Now, all of a sudden, uh, we are able to take hundreds and hundreds of people uh, outside of their organization for an hour and a half a month in a really cost-effective, time-efficient way. And we're also able to embrace that to do something which we love to do at Wavelength, which is democratize access to leadership education. So why should just... The, that access to be the preserve of the private sector. Why yeah. shouldn't we enable leaders from the charity, social enterprises, you know, the health service who are also grappling with the same issues, learn from the world's best organisations, world best leaders? And because digital has a low cost of, of delivery, we're able to massively cross subsidise and enable leaders from those worlds to to access um, uh, uh, that that stimulus as well. So. What it's enabled us to do, and and I think you know, what we're getting back is just people saying thank you, you know, thank you for the first time ever, mm. I'm able to to do this because you might recognise the need, but the the how, right? You know, are you really going to stop and search on Google for a TED talk on a topic that you you're not sure you want to? Is it good? Is it bad? Where if you could find a way, or your podcast? I mean, this podcast like this, you know, find a structure, right? to get the inspiration, the ideation that works for you, whether it's listening to podcasts, whether it's search, if your thing is to search the, 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 the web for, for random pub, uh, TED Talks, fantastic, or a Wavelength program, or, you know, go, go on to a, find a role as a NED on a board or a charity or even become mm. a school governor, which is what's the structure by which you can learn from the outside and that's why i'm so glad that we've gone onto youtube as well yes um my wife says i've got a face for radio but that's another story um <laughs> <laughs> we are on youtube anyway i think james is chuckling over there again as well um again it's great to hear what you've done in some ways we've all become a tech company and it's supersized yeah. you in relation to what you can yeah. do and you can now reach even more leaders and i am fascinated by the outside and i've had the privilege of going in market to yeah many of these places and, and taking executives to Silicon Valley and, yeah. and going into Rwanda, which yeah. was a deeply yes. personal, oh, yeah. even to yeah. this day, yeah. I remember that very fondly. Yes. Uh, and I think it was a bit of a life-changing yeah. moment. Yeah. So yeah. I've I, had I, those. Yeah, I love what you mm. do and, mm. and, and the power of it is there for all to see. Let me ask you, how can leaders be better then at becoming outside in, whether they're uh, solopreneurs, which someone you used that phrase that they've they've got small medium businesses where they've got 20, 30, 50 people relying on them each mm, day to mm. make sure that they can take a paycheck home, or whether there's an organisation with two hundred fifty thousand mm. people all over mm. the world. It's mm. still the human. Mm. It's still that connection piece. Mm. How can leaders? At this point, just start to think about mm. being more outside in, where mm. they are in some ways firefighting, yeah, and, and yeah. always getting, yeah, uh, maybe stuck in the weeds. How? Well, I think once you've recognised the need, then I think what you've got to do is start to experiment, perhaps with some... Um, I, I'm a great believer in structures. Right. right? Just wishing something's going to happen is never going to make it happen. No. Right. What structure can you put in place to ensure that you are getting that external inspiration? So it may be somebody you point in your personal boardroom who holds you accountable. Yeah that helps you recognize the need and says, right, let's agree a plan. Yeah. Over the next three months, six months, you are going to do X. You're going to attend these number of events, tune into these number of things, whatever it is, like whatever that plan looks like. So it could be somebody that holds you accountable. It could be you decide that actually you're going to take a role outside of your organization. Yeah. It could be a, could be as simple as you know trying to become a school governor as to, no, I'm going to put myself on the board of a different organization. I'm going to seek out uh, a non-executive directorship or an advisory role, you know, some, something like that. I'm going to be sign up to a program. I'm going to sign up to a program. I'm going to sign up to a podcast series. I'm going to, because I think, be you curious. Know, you be curious. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, and my absolute belief and my learned experiences is the first time you find yourself in a situation where you're not spending time looking internally, you look externally and you get either a new idea or a, a fresh energy or a short circuit to a problem you're shooting with, you'll go, I get this. Now, right. I get it. I now understand why this is so valuable, right? And then 
go for it. Then, then okay, fine. Like that, that gave me this idea. Where else could I go? Where else could I do? Goes back early. Says your diary, right? Mm. Put in your diary, right? F- for you know, whatever it is, nine o'clock on a Monday morning. I'm going to do. If you can't get a board, rolls like, you know, to to re- stop, read, reflect, listen, learn. It's like because just wishing it's going to happen isn't going to change anything. You've right. got to be structured around it, right? And it's like have a plan. You got to have a plan, right? And it's like you know, I'm just going to raise another point because you know you talk about deeply human leadership and deeply personal leadership. You know, and I think this is where the rubber hits the road. You mentioned earlier about, you know, we talked earlier about energy, right? And I think great leaders answer a really important question, which is where do you get your energy from? Right. And really asking yourself that question. And then and when you've answered that question, the answer then is to put structures in place to make sure that's where you get your energy from, right? right? And it's a bit like, and if for me, new ideas, new stimulus, new stories is part of where I get my energy from. And it's part, and it's my business model, so I have to do it, right? So there's a great a great congruence. But it goes back to this point of, um, you know, and, and so if you t- hear, we had the pleasure of Alistair Campbell speak last year. Right. And, and Alistair Campbell, who suffers massively with mental health and depression, has this brilliant concept he calls his jam jar, Right. And what he talks about is jam jars. He basically says, and it was some work he did with a therapist, and where I'm going with this is it just talks how structured you are. So he's broken down his jam jar, and he basically says, what you realize is basically in life, you have a jam, like the visuals like a jam jar, and the bottom of that jam jar, basically, there's, there's basically, which is the stuff at the foundations, which is your DNA, your genes, yep. basically stuff you can't, 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 can't touch right and then there's there's a level here and there's a level here but basically when you start getting to the top of the jam jar in terms of when you realize where you get your energy over, it's how do you grow your jam jar how do you become it how do you grow it so he said you know for him he's, he's got things like he talked about you know FFF he talks about friends family Fiona being his wife you know right. if his friend if his relationship with his wife is good and his friends is good then he feels better himself he laughs and says I go a level up like meaningful activities he says I'm a massive fan of a certain football club so I have to go watch them the bagpipes is a big part of his life he plays the bagpipes right, right? Okay. he goes his, his, his dog his bicycle are parts of his jam jar he has to ride enough he has to walk enough food Diet, exercise, and he starts going through this rationale and says, "You know, that's your jam jar. How do you grow it, right?" But and and but in the in in, in bid to grow his jam jar, what he says, he's paying attention to all the things where he knows he gets his energy from, right? right? Making sure the white relationship with his children, and his wife is good. Making sure he's getting enough sleep. Making sure he's not getting it right. Making sure he's riding his bike. Making sure he's watching his football club. Making sure he's playing his bagpipes. All those things, and I think a lot of leaders, especially in the corporate world, the wheels fall off the wagon, right? It, they, 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 they know it's important, but they just spend every day, you know, from seven in the morning till whatever time at night, particularly those with global jobs, just running on empty, right? Because they're not putting any structures they can't in make life. Any more withdrawals? Exactly. Left. Yeah, it's empty. It's empty, right? And I think you have to go. No, and you know, for me personally, you know, I literally, and my team laugh about it, you know, I am very structured. You know, I walk my dog three mornings a week between 7.45 and 8.45, and I use that time to think, and I'll also do some WhatsApp, you know, I'll do some work, but that's my time. In my diary, it says I play tennis on Tuesday from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and on a Thursday. Another tennis I swim. I swim on a Tuesday morning between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. I went swimming this morning. I go for a cycle ride on a Sunday. But in my diary, so... When this is your jam jar. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And my and and there's outside of that, there's you know time with my friends up north and my mother and you know it's like it's it, they're an important part of my life exactly. But it's it's in my diary, and so not that I ever ever I will yes I'll break it, but my PA knows just not to go there. Or if she goes, Adrian, Sacrosanct. there's a call with California. I, I'm trying to you know what do you want to do, How, uh, but she'll call me before. Sure. So I would really encourage people. Sorry, I'm glad we got on this way. Uh, I'd really encourage people to think about, you know, where do you get your energy from? Yep. You know, how therefore do you structure it? And if you, as you go back to earlier, think that l- getting external stimulus, ideas, networks could become part of your jam jar, uh, how, do you, how do you structure it? Uh, you know, as you're giving me that answer, I'm reflecting as regards to the podcast. You know, people say to me, well, where are you finding the energy for the podcast at, you know, evenings and weekends and you're, you've already got a full-time role and, you know, uh, how do you all cram it in? It, um, I think it's the energy that I get from meeting new people the network, and learning and just being insatiably curious as regards trying to understand. Yes. Um, I want to 
focus on an example because again we chatted earlier over coffee and i wanted to talk about the pandemic switched our approach to the future of work and yes what flexibility means and what do we all want now from a working perspective and you talked to me about a gathering yeah. strategy yeah. and i loved this and yeah. I, I really want us to talk about this because in some ways that's the outside in yeah. we're forced with now the world is never going back to how it was yeah however much someone yeah. might want it to yeah just tell everybody what you mean by a gathering strategy well this is an emergent thing that um i know that um airbnb are, are working on yep. so i haven't got i haven't got a fully formed uh, 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 answer to you but i think it's a really interesting concept but this is basically in response to so you know, we are now in the greatest period of experimentation when it comes to, yep. you know, the, the, the organizational culture and leadership that we've been through for forever. Yep. And I think lots of organizations and leaders are experimenting with what's the right way, hybrid, remote, what's the role of the office, how does it work? And an Airbnb are one of those organizations. Right. And I think I was saying to you earlier, if you step back to kind of Airbnb of old, and I say that old, I only mean before the pandemic, yes. and they still have this, but their physical environment in certainly San Francisco is unequivocally the best physical space I've ever, ha ever seen in my entire life. Like no corporate space has ever come close to it because they fundamentally... They, they had a guy called Aaron Harvey, who's an incredible thought leader in the space, in charge of it. He was their director of environments. And when they were creating the space, he answered one really important biz question, which is, what business are they in? They're in the hospitality business. And therefore, how do we bring every aspect of hospitality to life in how, how the building is designed, the messaging, the symbols, the meeting rooms, and yeah, I don't, I don't but this is a maniacal it. focus on culture. Oh, totally, absolutely, which is absolutely, so important. absolutely. So, just give you an example before I answer the question about the gathering strategy. Yep. So, in answer to the question, we're in the hospitality business, right? So, you'd walk in their offices, you'd register, then you'd go through a door. Just it was just a white door, but on the door it would say, "Welcome, superheroes, friends, families, dogs, cats," you know, to our home, and you're going. Oh my God, like I'm welcome, right? That's, that's the messaging on the back of a door, painted in red paint, cost nothing, right? You'd go in the space and everywhere would be the host. There was even a caravan that you could rent that was inside the offices, right? So it's a host space, right? But then you'd walk down a corridor and like lots of corridors in, 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 in corporates, there was all these meeting rooms, right? Yeah. But the difference was you turn this corridor and there's 57 different flags from all around the world, around the world where, where there was, they, were, they were operating. Then you walk up to the meeting room, and like lots of meeting rooms, there's a little little digital yeah, screen that said Adam, Adam, right? But this would say Adam's kitchen, right? And now on that screen was a picture of your kitchen because you, Adam, were a host on Airbnb, and right. there's your kitchen. And now I walk in the meeting room, and it's a scaled reproduction of your kitchen. It's incredible. Isn't and it? next door is Adrian's living room, and and they even had a reproduction of the founders living room, the flat in which it was founded, right? But the point was, everybody in head office, not losing touch with what business they're in. It's an experience. Business. It's every, experience. Every single every moment center, is an experience right? that reinforces exactly. the... Exactly. So, right so, so, uh, so that they had this, but of course, they've now gone um, to, you know, uh, work from anywhere, you know, live anywhere as, as Airbnb's ethos, well, they, right? They, the pandemic hit them uh, like all of us, Absolutely. Right? So, so they've now got, so they haven't got as many physical buildings now, and they're giving people total flexibility. But what they're also realising is, like, is how do you put a currency and a cadence through a remote or hybrid workforce, right? And what they're working on is something they're calling their gathering strategy. And I don't know where they think it's quite early days, but I think it's a really interesting concept, which is just, you know, how frequently should people be getting together? What's the cadence? What should be voluntary? What should be enforced? What's the purpose of it? And I think that's a really interesting piece of work to be doing because, and I think, you know, again, some related world stimulus on this, because I think there's something really in this. That's currently their gathering strategy. No, the gathering strategy. Aaron Harvey, who's now spun out of Airbnb, though also makes a really, really interesting point. And he says, the future, in future, your office should be, I think, everything that what they created at Airbnb, which is a place for education, connection, celebration. That's what you go to the office to do. Yeah, I love this. And he said, if then therefore his vision for the future is it's when you go to the office is when your out of office goes on. Yeah, this is great. Right? Because I'm there to connect, to be educated, to be informed, to reconnect with my brand, with my colleagues, why we work, what we do, not to do Zoom calls and Teams meetings 
I can do that from anywhere. Yeah. So give me the freedom to do that from anywhere, right? But I'm so busy now when I'm in this physical space doing all the above, I'm not available for all that stuff I can do anywhere else, right? Which I think is a brilliantly provocative statement. And his other related statement, which I think is great, is that he says, a place of work should tell you why you work and not who you work for, right? And you think of most buildings, you stick a logo on the outside, you walk in, and there it is, HSB, Heidelberg Studdles, Barclays, wherever it is, right? Great, I get the name of the company. Tell me why you exist. Yeah. Who do we serve? What are our values? What's our purpose? Like, what, give me that, right? Yet 99.9% .9 of organizations don't do that, and then they staff it with a prison guard from G4S, you know, and it's like, and you go, and you wonder why people don't want to go back to the office. Well, so many, we could just switch the logos, and that office could be the office of any one of a dozen totally. organizations in totally. cross sectors. Yeah. And yeah. is it really yeah. saying, as you say, not just who they are, but why, why exactly. they exist? What is the, what is, how are they a force for good? Yeah. What is it that they're doing for the communities and the people within which they are? You know, Absolutely. All of those kinds of things. But I think the gathering, you know, whether you, whatever you call it, but I think asking the question as leaders right now, if you've got a hybrid workforce or a fully remote workforce yeah. or whatever it is, you know, what is the cadence of connectivity? you need to put through your organization. Yeah. And the chances are you have to work a lot harder at it now and be a lot more deliberate about your culture than you ever were before, right? I mean, you know, I, I know one called Barbie Garver. She was the chief people officer of GitLab, which was the world's only, arguably, only fully remote company. Right. F countries of 55 countries, 5,000 employees, multi-billion dollar valuation, never had an office ever. And I did a, actually did a podcast with Barbie a couple of, about 18 months, two years ago, just the pandemic hit. And she said, you know, she uttered, she said, she said, she said, the thing you have to realize this, and this goes for fully remote. I actually say it almost goes for hybrid as well. She said, in a, in a fully remote organization, everything that was informal in a physical environment has to be formal. And the reverse comes true. So she said, for example, the classic water cooler conversation. Everyone goes, oh my God. My organization can't cope unless people, you know, serendipitally beat each other in the corridor. She said, so on a Monday morning, we had a water cooler conversation. It was structured. It was in the diary. And the only thing you did was to talk for half an hour about what you did at the weekend and show pictures of the cats and the dogs and your holidays. Because it's exactly what you do in the, in the physical world. The we structure it. The formal. The formal, right? Wow. You can't. So you structure it, right? You, you, you know, and, you know, she was very provocative about it. And I totally, totally endorse what she said. Because people, I think leaders who go, oh, you know, well, of course, you know, I, physical spaces are brilliant for breaking down silos and random connections. She goes, BS. You meet the same goddamn people on the same goddamn corridors in the same offices day in, day out. I've been there. I've done that. Mm. You do not break down silos and develop great connectivity because you have a physical office. And she goes, here's what we do. Got to be deliberate. We, yeah. Well, they have a piece of software uh, uh, at GitLab. This has been 18 months, two years ago. I was using it. She said... And she said, we call it Big Brother watching you. She said, but we were like, we would know from your diary who you'd spoken to. How, when did you last speak to a, to a peer in a different team or a different sector? And then what the software would do was it identified a gap in your connectivity. It would structure a half an hour call in your diary with that person. <laughs> well, these are like the organizational network analysis tools, yeah, right? That exactly. But, you know, so you're going, so tell me, does my software looking at your diary, seeing where you're spending your time, and actually doing an algorithm that says that Adam's never spoken to anybody in sales or marketing for three months, beat walking down the same corridor every day on the off chance you'll meet with somebody, hands down. But again, it's that structuring, the, yeah. you know, so it's that concept of going, I now need to be much more deliberate about the cadence of our culture in a way I didn't have to do before. Well, I think we've dealt with some fascinating uh, scenarios here you've really got me thinking which is again why i do the the podcast and so how can people connect and get in touch with you adrian to connect, uh, carry on the conversation get you involved in their conversations how um well i mean so uh, wavelengthleadership.com is our website um uh, everything's on there i'm just adrian at uh, at, at uh, wavelengthleadership.com is my email address right. um so that we're on we're on uh, linkedin massive linkedin users so wavelength 
It is on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. So I think the website's a great resource. That's okay. wavelengthleadership.com. Uh, email me directly at adrian at wavelengthleadership.com. Um, LinkedIn um, uh, is also, we're very proactive on that as well. So lots of okay. postings that we do. And after, after you, basically every week, we're uploading snapshots of events or podcasts or interviews that we're hosting. So as a structure to bring the outside world in, just follow Wavelength on, on, on LinkedIn Perfect. as well. Well, I, hopefully you'll include this one as well, Adrian. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> as, you are, as you share all the learning and wisdom. Listen, you've been an absolute star. Thanks so much for taking the time and effort to come into the studio. Uh, and welcome to the Leadership Enigma. Thank you. Absolute pleasure, Adam. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with your host on LinkedIn or visit the dedicated website, www.leadersenigma.com, powered by Transform Performance International, where you can access our exclusive learning, including books, videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.